He and George were awarded the Nobel Prize together in 1967. George for the elucidation of the visual pigment biochemistry and Keffer for the uh, making the first single unit recordings from any eye and secondly and probably more importantly the elucidation of the lateral inhibition that occurs in the eye of Limulus. He was really the person who got me into science. Yeah, I mean, if we want to go back even further than that, he was a student of, he of Selig Hecht, who did many of his famous experiments here at the MBL, who was a student of G.H. Parker, a name probably that you don't know um, anything about, but Parker was an invertebrate zoologist interested in behavior. And um, uh, Hecht uh, worked as a graduate student with Parker, and then Wald worked as a graduate student with Hecht. And of course, Hecht's great contribution was to show that sensory systems obeyed the laws of, of chemistry and physics. They showed classic photochemical um, um, you know, bases for how they behave. And the work he did here, which was so seminal for Wald, was to show that uh, you could model what was going on in light and dark adaptation by assuming that there was a, a photosensitive molecule that then, in the light, broke down into two substances. I think he called the sensory molecule S, and then the two products were, were P and A, and then that was what happens in light adaptation, and as you lose the photosensitive pigment, you're going to lose sensitivity, okay? And then in the dark, you put back PNA to make S again, and that regains uh, photosensitivity. He recognized even then that it had to be more complicated than that, and in fact, you know, I think my first important contribution to the field was to show that there's not a direct linear relationship between the amount of visual pigment in the eye and visual sensitivity, but it's log linear. But Hecht emphasized the point that there was a relationship between visual pigment and visual sensitivity, but he never could really prove what that was because he couldn't get at the, at the molecules itself. And that's where Wall came in to play. That is, after he got his degree with, uh, with, with Hecht, and while he was working with Hecht, he was studying the properties of vision in Drosophila, doing the kinds of things that, that Hecht had done on clams and tunicates with Drosophila. But what he wanted to do was get his hands on the molecules. What were P and A? And he did his classic experiment while he was a postdoc in Europe. And uh, by then, which was the mid-30s, it was known that vitamin A plays an important role in vision. Interesting stories there, but we probably don't have time to go into them. Uh, and uh, the question was, and, and Wald went to talk to some of the great, uh, work with some of the great uh, vitamin A retinoid biochemists of the day. Zeckhauser and, and, and Warburg and Meyerhoff, all of whom were interested in, in these kinds of things. And what he showed as a postdoc was that if you take a retina that is totally dark adapted, okay, uh, then you extract it with, a, with a, a weak organic solvent like petroleum ether. You couldn't extract any retinoids, any vitamin A-like substance from the dark adapted retina. If you took a light adapted retina, then you could extract abundant vitamin A from the retina. And that had been known before. So what Wall did was start with a dark adapted retina, illuminated it with short bursts of light, and showed that initially with a weak organic solvent that you could extract a substance that was retinoid in character but clearly was different from vitamin A. It was yellow, for example. It was a new compound. He called it retinine. Now we know it's vitamin A aldehyde 
or retinal is its modern name. So the question was, what was going on? And so uh, you couldn't extract any retinine with the weak organic solvent, petroleum ether, from the dark adapted retina. But if you used a stronger solvent like chloroform that would strip lipid off a protein, then you could extract retinine um, from the retinas. And so he postulated in his classic 1935 paper, I think it was, that uh, what was going on is that the visual pigment consisted of a protein to which was bound vitamin A, or he, he called it retinine. Now we know it's vitamin A aldehyde. And that what light does is to release the vitamin A aldehyde from the protein. That's visual yellow. And then the retinine is converted to vitamin A, which is colorless. And uh, so that the final bleaching product, which actually had been called visual white way back in Kuna's day, consists of protein plus vitamin A, the yellow compound that Kuna had observed, he said was protein plus retinine, and then the visual pigment was protein to which was bound the vitamin A aldehyde. And you know, that has really the, the answer to what, what visual pigment molecules are made of. And both rod and cone pigments are identical. And there are variations here and there, but that's basically uh, the story. And then, of course, he went on to show that to resynthesize the visual pigment from retinaldehyde and protein, you need a particular cis isomer, a bent form of vitamin A. First time that a role for cis trans isomerization had been shown important in biology. And that was a major discovery that he and his uh, colleagues, Ruth Hubbard, who eventually became his wife, and Paul Brown, his longtime technician, showed very nicely. You know, Keffer was mainly an electrophysiologist. George was mainly a biochemist. And they knew each other, they were good friends. Uh, and uh, I don't think they ever worked together, but, um, you know, Keffer, uh, uh, his work, uh, MBL played a very large role in his work in that um, as an undergraduate, I think it's Swarthmore, I may be wrong on that, but I think it's Swarthmore. He studied um, the response of pill bugs, I think it was, to light. And that fascinated him in terms of trying to get at, at visual mechanisms and the physiology of, of visual mechanisms. So he came, to, he was a medical student, I believe, at Penn, or it might have been Hopkins, I can't remember which, and came to the MBL, I think in the summer of 31, or uh, uh, 31, I think it was, and he recorded uh, the ERG, the electroretinogram, it's a field potential, from a number of animals and found that the uh, horseshoe crabs, um, especially the little ones, gave a very nice ERG. And so, um, knowing something about the anatomy of the visual system, that the optic nerve runs right underneath the shell in horseshoe crabs, he decided to come back, and I think this was 32 or maybe 33, but about that time, to see if he could isolate a single optic nerve fiber from uh, coming from the eye and record single unit activity using wick electrodes where you just take the, a, a nerve and put it on a piece of, of, um, of, of cotton that's moistened with ringer's solution and then you amplify it and so on and so forth. And uh, the story he told one night when George Wall had invited Keffer to dinner and I happened to be there and Keffer was telling the story of how he succeeded in doing it. It was an interesting one that relates to, to the MBL. It's a story that probably should be told. Um, because Keffer could record such nice ERGs from little horseshoe crabs, you know, which are only maybe five or six uh, inches across the carapace, uh, he decided to try to see if he could isolate a single nerve fiber from those animals. And 
the way he described it, he said, I spent the whole summer trying to do that. And he said, it just never, I never could do it. One nice feature of the horseshoe crab optic nerve, which we appreciate now, was that whereas most nerves are very tightly bound together in a nerve with glial cells in horseshoe crabs, for some unknown reason, it's much easier to fray the optic nerve. So he did it and he said, you know, I could get down and occasionally have a preparation when there were three or four active fibers, but I never could do better than that. So he said, I was pretty close to the end of the summer. He said, I think I had only one or two days more of, uh, to, to spend doing experiments. And I went down to the supply house to get one of my little horseshoe crabs, which gave a very nice ERG. And he said they didn't have any. All they had were these big horseshoe crabs that had barnacles on them. And he had recorded the ERG from those animals. And he said it was always crummy. So he just assumed, you know, that they wouldn't have very good responses. So the way he described it that night, and I can still remember him describing it, he said, you know, I debated, should I go sailing today and just say the hell with it, or shall I try one of these big ones? So he said, I debated it for a few minutes. He said, well, let's give it a try. So he takes the big one back, cuts the eye out, isolates the optic nerve, and he said in something like three or four minutes, he had a single unit, first time. Why? He said, I'm sure I didn't have a single fiber, but I had a, a, a group of fibers of which only one was active. In other words, the others had died. And he said, but there was a single unit. So that classic paper that he wrote in either 33, 32 or 33 was based on just something like two days of experiments that were done right at the end of the summer using the big horseshoe crabs. Um, and again, he said, I'm convinced you know, that I was doing the dissection just as well uh, on the small ones as I did on the big ones. But of course, with the big ones, since many of the, the photoreceptor cells had died for one reason or another, and that was why they gave such a small ERG, he said, I could get a preparation which was only a single active fiber. So of course, you know, initially he thought he was recording the electrical responses coming directly from the photoreceptors. And then only later did he realize, and I'm not sure whether he was the one who made this realization or not, that indeed there, there are two types of cells in each omatidium, in each unit. About 10 to 12, or maybe a few more photoreceptor cells, which feed into a second order cell, the eccentric cell, okay? And the photoreceptors, actually, we now know, connect electrically to the single large dendrite of the eccentric cell. And so when you illuminate the eye, it's the receptor cells that then feed into the eccentric cell and at the axon hillock, where the axon comes off the cell body, is where you generate the action potentials. And um, he studied, of course, that preparation for a number of years and made some very important observations. But then, well, his real main claim to fame was he described that as one day he said, I always used to do my experiments in the dark, as most of us who work on the, on, on the physiology do, because you, a uh, vision do, because you want to have a constant environment. So he said one day, he said, uh, I was sitting there recording from an optic, single optic nerve fiber coming from, from the eye, and uh, somebody walked into the room and turned on the lights. And he said, you know, they've added more light to the preparation, but the activity went down. He said, I turned off the lights, the activity went up, I turned on the lights, they went down. And he said, gee, there must be some interactions going on in the eye. And pretty soon was able to show that there is this reciprocal lateral inhibition between the amatidia, which are mediated by very fine nerve processes that come off the optic nerve and run laterally in the eye, and they've been identified anatomically and so on and so forth, and that really began the real important contribution that he made of lateral inhibition explaining the Mach band phenomenon. 
the enhancement of edges and borders that's so important in every visual system.